so good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's impressive, uh, all the students that, that we have uh, here today. So uh, David Carr, professor of economics at the University of California, Teresa Monllao, uh, dean of the schools of economics and business, Joan Monraz, a professor uh, at the School of Economics and Business, the students, uh, professors, and, and colleagues. It's uh, an absolute um, honor to participate in the opening ceremony of the academic year for the School of Economics and Business uh, on this special, uh, special occasion. First of all, I would like to welcome uh, the 800 uh, new undergraduate masters and doctoral students who are joining one of the top economic, uh, economics schools in Europe today. This status is uh, confirmed, among other indicators, by leading international rankings. For instance, the latest uh, edition of the Times Higher Education Ranking, published indeed uh, last week, which evaluates uh, aspects such as teaching quality and international outlook, uh, places the school uh, 29th in Europe and 93rd uh, worldwide. And this is uh, this not only attests to the, the prestige of our programs, but also highlights the quality and the excellence that you as new students uh, bring to this university. So thank you very much. This uh, high demand for the school's uh, programs, coupled with its competitive entry uh, requirements, places you among the best students in the university uh, system here in Catalonia. So th therefore, I, I encourage you uh, to, make, to make the most of all the resources that UPF of offers and to help you uh, continue to excel. To begin this uh, journey of uh, learning, today we have the, the privilege of attending the inaugural lecture of uh, Professor David Card, Nobel Laureate in Economics uh, 2021, and uh, one of the world's most renowned uh, economists. Professor Card, uh, it's a great honor for us to host you here at the UPF. We are really uh, grateful to have or that you accepted our school's uh, invitation. And with today's inaugural lecture, Professor Carr joins, indeed, a distinguished group of economists who, through their opening lectures, provide uh, rigorous academic insights into the global challenges uh, we face, actually, as a society. I'm confident that this lecture, focused on evidence-based uh, public pol uh, policy, will offer us uh, very valuable insights into how academia and science can contribute meaningfully to addressing these uh, global and important uh, challenges. So thank you very much, Professor Carr, and welcome to our university. Thank you. Gracias, Rectora. As a Dean of the Economics and Business Faculty, it's a great pleasure and privilege to welcome our distinguished guests to this opening lecture of the academic year 2024-2025, Professor David Carr. Vull donar la benvinguda a tots els que formen part de la facultat i el Departament d'Economia i Empresa de la nostra universitat, especialment a aquells estudiants de grau, màster i doctorat que aquest any cursaran el seu primer curs. També vull donar la benvinguda a totes aquelles persones, amics, organitzacions i empreses que col·laboren amb nosaltres i que avui ens acompanyen. La Facultat d'Economia i Empresa és una comunitat dedicada a formar professionals i investigadors que siguin capaços de fer front als reptes i desafiaments del nostre entorn econòmic i social. Avançar en la qualitat dels nostres estudis és l'objectiu principal de la nostra facultat. Assolir aquest objectiu seria impossible si no tinguéssim, per una banda, un professorat nacional i internacional preparat per desenvolupar la seva tasca com a docent i investigador, 
i, per l'altra, la col·laboració dels principals agents econòmics i empresarials del nostre entorn. Som una facultat internacional. Els nostres professors, estudiants i personal d'administració formen part, des de fa molt temps, d'equips internacionals. Això ens converteix en una facultat oberta al món. Alhora, sabem acollir els nostres visitants, integrant-los i ensenyant-los la nostra cultura, la nostra llengua, els nostres costums. També som una facultat social, preocupada pels problemes del nostre món. Fomentem activitats fora de l'àmbit estrictament acadèmic que ens ajuden a entendre l'entorn social. Les activitats associatives dels nostres estudiants, la creació de xarxes entre estudiants i alumni, així com l'organització de debats i xerrades amb representants del món econòmic i social, són un exemple de com els nostres estudiants, la nostra comunitat, pot entendre millor la realitat en què vivim i, per tant, contribuir a millorar-la. Aprofito l'ocasió per encoratjar a tots els membres de la nostra comunitat, especialment professors, investigadors i estudiants, a continuar treballant per la millora de la qualitat, que ha estat i és la principal característica de la facultat des del seu naixement. Professor Carr, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. I hope you enjoy your visit to the Pompeu Fabra University. I hope you enjoy your visit to Barcelona. Moltes gràcies a tots. Ara dono la paraula al professor Joan Monràs, que presentarà el professor David Carr. So, welcome uh, everyone. In some sense, it's a difficult task because uh, Professor David Cart, Cart uh, needs a little introduction. He was awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics in 2021 in recognition for his empirical contributions to labor economics. He is the class of 1950 Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of California, Berkeley, and has held positions at Chicago Booth and Princeton. He obtained his PhD in economics at Princeton University in 1983 and has had an extended and influential career since. Most importantly, perhaps, he's the author of many important research articles that have shaped generations of economists, both his own multiple PhD students and beyond. His contributions have not only affected researchers, but also policymakers and policy making as I imagine Professor Scott's lecture will show. I could talk about many different things about uh, Professor uh, Card's career, but one perhaps distinctive feature of uh, David Card's influence in the profession is that he has shaped how we currently uh, write empirical papers. Talking about research design, empirical strategy, natural experiments, sources of plausibly exogenous variation, and evaluations of public policy programs is now current practice that owes much to Cart's research. Linking reduced form evidence to economic models is perhaps an un underappreciated aspect in many of his papers. Providing careful reduced form evidence and interpretations of the findings is common feature in David Cart's work. Based on empirical evidence, Professor Card's research has profoundly shaped our understanding of the returns to education, the effects of minimum wage, migration economics, and vari various public policy programs affecting labor market outcomes, among many other contributions. I hope this brief introduction highlights Professor Card's deep influence in our profession and beyond. Without further delay, please let me welcome Professor Card to the Liceo Inaugural de Economia, where he will talk about evidence-based public policy. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, very kind introductions. It's a great um, privilege to be here. I, um, I uh, have been uh, in Barcelona a number of times, the first time in 1990, so it's, uh, it's great to see um, 
how much things have uh, progressed in, in this, particular in this part of the city, uh, but also uh, in the Catalonia. And um, so I'm gonna give a, a, a talk about um, uh, cause and effect, the issue of causality and evidence-based policy. I'm gonna try and um, leave lots of time for questions uh, at the end. So I'm, I'm gonna speak very quickly, which is uh, one of my uh, big flaws. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, in, in economics, there's a long history of um, uh, economists giving policy advice. Um, people maybe don't know that uh, the wealth of nations is really just a giant uh, volume of policy advice, uh, largely focused on the issue of mercantilism. Um, obviously, um, Donald Trump hasn't read it. Um, <laughs> David Ricardo, uh, whose uh, name seems awfully close to mine, um, was, is developed the theory of comparative advantage, uh, arguing uh, that uh, Britain should open up free trade to um, other countries in Europe. Um, obviously, the British are not paying attention anymore. Um, Francis Walker uh, was the founder of the American Economic Association, uh, most famous these days for a very vitriolic piece he wrote in the Atlantic magazine, um, arguing uh, against uh, immigration from, um, from Europe um, and arguing against, uh, in particular, uh, Jewish immigration, which if you know anything about the history of uh, economics and Nobel Prizes, it would have been a terrible mistake. Um, so the advice of these economists was largely based on uh, what we would think of as models and assumptions. Um, so Smith and Ricardo obviously had great knowledge of the world that they were studying, but they didn't really have empirical evidence to talk about demand curves or supply curves. In fact, they didn't really have that much of an analytical framework. Um, but in the past 50 years, there's been a gradual shift in the way that economists um, make recommendations and uh, toward a, a system where people who are advocating for policies typically will bring in evidence to try and make their case. Um, and what that requires in most cases is uh, some kind of evidence on causal claims. Uh, for example, uh, how does the arrival of immigrants affect the labor market outcomes of natives when that happens? Um, so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the idea of scientific evidence. Um, I'll, I'll mention or describe um, how we now think about that in um, most social sciences um, based on the ideas of um, randomized experiments and counterfactuals developed in the 1930s by a Berkeley statistician named Jersey Naiman. Uh, I'll then talk about social experiments and then um, lastly I'll be focusing on the idea of uh, non-experimental evidence. So how do we draw plausible scientific evidence from non-experimental designs. I'll talk with applications to two areas that um, have been mentioned and that were prominent in my work many years ago, uh, immigration and minimum wages. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end just to summarize about like what do we, how is this really working? Do we really have a lot of confidence that, <laughs> that w all this evidence is really mattering so much? Um, so let's start with the topic of scientific evidence. Um, so when you're a high school student, at least in North America, in the ninth grade or 10th grade, you're taught about the idea of um, the scientific method. And they do a terrible job of explaining this, uh, but <laughs> uh, what's supposed to be true in, in the scientific method, at least as I recall it, I looked it up recently to make sure I remembered it right, was you were supposed to propose an hypothesis and test it. And a, a classic example of that uh, was Boyle's uh, air bell experiment. So Boyle was the guy who discovered Boyle's law, which is a law of um, uh, thermodynamics describing the relation between pressure and temperature. Uh, and this is Boyle, Mr. Boyle. Boyle invented uh, a vacuum pump. Uh, actually, that wasn't a thing that was well known. And what he did with the vacuum pump is pump the air out of the, the bell jar, and you could observe that the dove would die. And did this many times all through Europe. He went around. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was so famous that this very well-known painter did this picture. Um, now, what that's an example of is something that uh, I think that's kind of what we're trying to teach students in high school about is this idea that you can propose an hypothesis and test it with a single decisive measurement. Um, 
Uh, and there's some very famous examples of that. Um, one example is uh, the, the very first test of Einstein's theory of relativity was a, a test looking at the, the um, basically the bending of the light uh, coming from Mercury around the sun at the time of an eclipse. And when that measurement was announced, it was almost instantaneously realized that you know, there was something to Einstein's theory and he became basically a world famous celebrity uh, almost overnight. Uh, there's other examples of that, but in many areas uh, in uh, social science, medicine, and even in physical sciences, there's too much variability in outcomes to really have a, a single decisive uh, uh, experiment. Nevertheless, oftentimes that's kind of implicitly what uh, journalists and politicians are thinking about. And so it's important to think of that as a benchmark when you're trying to explain something to somebody and say that there's a causal effect because they sort of think, well, if there's a causal effect, there has to be a single decisive measurement. So if outcomes vary a lot, uh, what do we do? Well, um, it was recognized early in the 19th century that you could possibly treat a larger population with the intervention and see kind of what happened on average. Uh, a good example of that, uh, there was a, a pretty well-known demonstration of um, how cowpox, uh, exposure to cowpox actually Im immunized you from um, smallpox. Uh, and that's why we call it a vaccination, because of VACA, of course, since I guess most people here speak Spanish, you know what that is. Um, and this is a picture of, um, it went to the uh, uh, milkmaids at the t at the, uh, in the 18th century, a lot of times the larger dairies had women doing the milking and uh, they had these pox and you took the serum from that and exposed it to children and it was known that that worked. Um, in the uh, in the 19th century and into the early 20th century, there was a lot of experimentation with agriculture and people realized that we could have, you know, new uh, seeds would be uh, evolving, uh, new, new branches of, or types of beans and seeds. And it was thought that it would be good to try and experiment with that. And uh, there's kind of an interesting story about that because there, there's a well-known research station, it still exists in Britain called the Rothenham Station. And all through the uh, end of the 19th century, they had been experimenting with different varieties of different kinds of grains and cereals. And uh, this famous statistician who was actually an Australian was called in, at that time he wasn't so famous, he was sort of called in to straighten it out. Because the data really didn't seem to be leading anywhere. People would say, well, one year we planted this, this species of rye in this field, and it did well. The next year we planted it, it did poorly. And then we tried a different species, it did well, then it did poorly. And so what Fisher realized that, that it wasn't enough to have kind of a, a treatment group, you needed to have a control group. And he devised uh, a system of planting fields with uh, interspe uh, interspersed varieties of, uh, of, species, of the seeds that were being tried. And this is actually a picture of his field. And that, that's one of uh, Fisher's designs. If you ever study the history of experiments, you might um, know that this is called a Latin square. Um, and that really was an amazing breakthrough. The idea that you had to have a control group in a very organized way. And uh, over the next couple of decades, people started to realize that we could do that with human populations and other populations, not just fields. So here's an example. This is uh, the idea of a, of a randomized control trial with two uh, groups, a control group and a treatment group. And in, in an RCT, the reason why it's called a randomized is because you take this a, a potential population and you split them randomly, okay? It cannot be deterministic, it has to be random. Ideally, in uh, medical experiments, um, the subjects don't know their status, which is one of the reasons why we, they would be given these placebo pills or placebo injections, so that they don't really know whether they've been affected or not, to try and avoid the problem that when people think that they've been treated, that can actually have some quote unquote placebo effect. In addition, in, in uh, good uh, medical experiments, the people who are doing the measurements don't know who's who because, of course, inevitably, they're going to be a little bit biased. Uh, and so when that's done, what people do is they compare the outcomes of the treatment group and the control group, and they say that's the result of that RCT. So why does that work? This gives me an opportunity to bring up Star Trek, which you never want to pass up if you're giving a public lecture, although uh, it's not entirely clear that anybody in this audience remembers um, 
this particular episode, this is not Spock and Kirk. This is evil Spock and evil Kirk. And uh, what's going on is uh, that when you randomly split the population, you're creating a parallel universe. And if you know Star Trek, you know that the number one repeating theme is one of parallel universes. So what the, kind of, what the control group does is it provides uh, what we now call in economics a counterfactual, which you could think of as the parallel universe for what the treatment group would be if they hadn't been treated. And uh, that's a way to think about uh, what exactly you're learning. You're learning with a control group what the, the mirror image of, of the treated group would be in the absence of treatment. And the reason why this works is because the two groups were randomly assigned. So in the absence of treatment, you would have no reason to think that they would be different. And if you have large samples and so on, that can usually be uh, uh, the, the degree of precision with that can be measured with very simple statistical ideas. Now, a lot of debates uh, arise in our field and in other fields uh, because they don't have a good way to mest estimate the counterfactual. So if you think about in the United States, for instance, right now, there's still an ongoing debate about the causes of uh, inflation uh, between 2020 and 2022. And the reason why that's not gonna be easy to ever resolve, and we'll still be arguing about that 50 years from now, is because there isn't uh, any counterfactual. There is no country that didn't have recovery from COVID and didn't have some monetary intervention. Um, okay, so the idea of these um, RCTs became uh, more and more accepted in, um, especially in the United States in, in the uh, 1940s and 50s. Um, there's a very famous example from 1954, which is just around the time I was born. At that time, there was this uh, scourge of a disease called polio, which every summer would go through the um, United States and Canada. Um, and it would uh, leave a, um, a lot of uh, children permanently um, paralyzed or partially paralyzed and had a devastating effect. And uh, in 1954, this uh, uh, Guy Salk invented uh, a polio vaccine, and the uh, a, a, a charity called the March of Dimes charity um, basically got together enough money to do a 1.8 million child RCT. Uh, and this is pretty famous because my parents uh, remembered this going on. They're they're kind of in between. They were just out of school when this happened, but. Um, they remember this going on because they did some of the some of the sites were in Canada where I grew up, and uh, they basically this is an, a line of kids waiting to get injections, and every second needle was saline, and ever, and, and the other one was the actual um, uh, vaccine. Now, why did they need such a big sample? Well, the reason why is because polio has a very low incidence, although it's devastating what happens, only about 50 and 100,000 people actually get it in any given year. And the risk is like a lot of uh, diseases, and if you study diseases at all, you know this is very common. There's like pockets of infection that are extremely hard to predict. So one part of the country, this is true with COVID even today, one part of the country will have an outbreak and other parts will be fine. And then next year, it'll be a different part and very hard to predict. So they had to have this big sample. Within a year, the results were very clear that this worked. And so everybody uh, you know, got the, the polio vaccine in the next 10 years. And, and for a long time, we thought that this had been eradicated until the anti-vaxxers uh, emerged. Uh, OK, in the 1960s, these ideas started to spill over into economics. Um, this was an era where there was great interest in trying to um, um, reimagine uh, welfare programs and social programs. In the United States, it was called the Great Society Programs under John Kennedy and later uh, Lyndon Johnson. And in 1966, a uh, graduate student at MIT, now this is an inspiration for all you graduate students. This was a kid in Bob Solo's labor economics class named Heather Ross. And she got the idea, she read uh, Milton Friedman and James Tobin had both been talking about uh, negative income taxes, the idea of reforming the, the tax system to have uh, the tax not just positive, but go negative if your income was low enough. And so she got the idea that, they sh that HHS, the Health and Human Services, should run an experiment on that. And she wrote a letter to the secretary of HHS, and somehow or other, it actually happened. So eventually, four different uh, uh, experiments were conducted and, uh, on negative income tax. At the same time, 
a bunch of health economists glommed on and it started the, uh, what was called the RAND health insurance experiment. Um, and so this was an era when these, uh, you know, surprisingly somebody could make a suggestion and all of a sudden we have scientific evidence being produced. By the 1970s, so this is by the time I'm now uh, in, in uh, undergraduate, so the age of, of, of some of you in the mid-1970s, um, enthusiasm for these grand social experiments had kind of faded out. Uh, you know, this was the disco era. Uh, <laughs> it, was not, it was not the best time. Uh, people had long hair and bad teeth. Um, and there, people realized there were some problems with the NIT experiments, so probably if you take a more advanced labor economics class, they might, you might go through some of that. The next generation of social experiments evolved over time and became much more modest and focused in their scale, um, but it has gradually uh, exerted a lot of influence, this idea, and so in particular in the field of development economics, and this is Esther Duflo and um, her husband, Abhijit Banerjee, who won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for their work in uh, doing RCTs and, uh, to help policy uh, making in uh, developed countries. Um, now, in a lot of cases, you can uh, not do an, an experiment very easily. Um, for example, it's kind of hard to imagine a randomized control trial of minimum wage or a rise in immigration because you can't, you can't really randomly raise the minimum wage for a few employers and not for others. Um, there's other limitations of RCTs. One of the most important is that um, you can't be sure when you do an RCT that the results that you see in the experiment will scale up when you try and, uh, if, if you took the results and tried to generalize them. And to tell you the truth, um, that happens all over the place uh, all the time. So I do some consulting in the tech sector. And in, in the tech sector, they do many, 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 uh, what they call A-B experiments uh, on, on the websites that they're running to try and sell people things. And a lot of times, something that looks good in the A-B experiment uh, will not totally work when they try and roll it out more generally for a variety of reasons. Now, uh, what do you do in that situation? Well, in many real life situations, there's a group of people or firms or schools or whatever that are exposed to some treatment and others that are not. For example, uh, when um, in the 1980s, the, in the United States, there used to be a single federal minimum wage and there was a provision on the books in many states that they could have their own minimum wage, but throughout the 70s, the the federal government had raised the minimum wage to a level that no states felt like they needed to go beyond that. But by the end of the Reagan era, and the end of the 1980s, the federal minimum wage had been held constant. And so a bunch of states started to experiment with raising their own minimums above the federal level. And that creates uh, what uh, we could call a natural experiment. Um, another example, I'll be talking about this one in a, in a minute, is if you're trying to study what's the effect of a, a, a violent separatist movement. So this happened in my home country of Canada in the 1970s in Quebec. It happened in the Basque region around the same time. Now there's a, another example where you couldn't imagine an RCT, but maybe you could think of a, a non-experimental design. So these are called natural experiments or quasi-experiments. Um, oftentimes there's a sort of a treatment group, so that's the set of uh, employers in a state where the minimum wage has gone up, and there's a control group, which is a set of uh, employers in other states. How would you know that the comparison group provides a valid counterfactual? That's the number one question that confronts a non-experimental design. Can you use the comparison group as a true parallel universe, or is there other things that are different about that? And almost always, the two groups will not be the same. So almost always when you have um, a quasi-experimental situation, the characteristics of the group that get the treatment and the other group that doesn't are different. So for instance, in the case of the, um, uh, of the minimum wage, employers in New Jersey and employers in Pennsylvania, and an example that I, I'm gonna talk about in a minute, were somewhat different. Um, so what people realized, um, and I, I actually credit this observation to my thesis advisor, Orly Eschenfelter, who uh, first figured this out in the analysis of training programs in the 1970s, and that had a huge impact on um, and my own thinking about this area. And Orly and I wrote a couple of papers uh, on this, including one in 1985, 
where uh, I remember very specifically in the middle of the night, the paper was due the next morning and we were still working on it and Orly was uh, kind of dawdling along on the introduction and all of a sudden he got very excited because he invented the term difference of differences. Uh, and and he, was, he was convinced that this was a great term. Now it turned out he was right, but <laughs> we didn't get a copyright on it, so <laughs> didn't really do us any good. Uh, anyway, uh, the idea was, look, if you have a treatment group and a control group, they don't, maybe they're different, but maybe the gap between them in an outcome of interest has stayed constant over time until now. And now when we get the treatment, you would say, well, if after the treatment is brought in, if the control, if control group kind of moves along as it had before and the treatment group goes up or down differently, then we could say, well, actually, that seems like it might be evidence of a causal effect. Because in the absence of this treatment, those two groups, although they aren't the same, their outcomes were moving in a similar uh, parallel fashion. Um, and so the first example that I worked on on this on a larger scale was the Mariel boat lift. And this gives me a, an opportunity to bring up another uh, well-known um, uh, popular culture item, Scarface, the movie. Um, I guess people in Spain don't know about Scarface too much, but it's a movie about a criminal played by Al Pacino who happened to be one of the Marielitos. He was one of the um, uh, Cubans who came to uh, Miami in 1980. Uh, so there was a, a demonstration in uh, Havana and Fidel Castro kind of got the idea, I, I assume he was kind of like coming up with something in the middle of the night, that he said, well, if anybody is, is a, not liking Cuba at this point, they can, they're free to leave, which they hadn't been before then. He said they're free to leave if they just go down to the Port of Mariel. And I don't think that Castro was fully thinking, but uh, Cuba is actually not that far from Miami, and already in Miami, there were several million uh, displaced Cubans from the 1960s uh, era. And so uh, what happened over the next couple of months is the Cubans in Miami set up a, a flotilla of boats and brought over 125,000 people um, in, in just a matter of a couple of months to, uh, to, and most of those, about 80% of them settled in uh, Miami. And uh, the result was a 7% increase in the Miami workforce uh, almost overnight. And I became aware of this from an undergrad uh, this is again, inspiration for the students. This, uh, an undergrad um, who I was teaching at Princeton at the time had grown up in uh, Miami, and he told me about this um, experience. I had seen Scarface, but didn't realize that the opening scene is really uh, Marielito's landing in uh, Miami. Uh, and um, uh, eventually, I uh, figured out that it would be possible to potentially construct one of these difference and differences kind of analysis. Uh, looking at the effect uh, in Miami relative to a control group. And I, um, this was early on in the evolution of this kind of research. And so I kind of uh, constructed a control group in a somewhat ad hoc manner using four cities, Tampa, Atlanta, Houston, and Los Angeles. And uh, this is what the data looks like. So this is the uh, logarithm. Okay. If you're just a first year economist, uh, I don't know how many are first years in the room, but you're gonna find out something very quickly, which is if you're a labor economist, everything's in logarithms. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of rude awakening if you don't know that. Uh, okay, so this is the log of the weekly wage of low-skilled uh, non-immigrant workers in Miami uh, over time, 1973 here. And the boat lift is gonna be data looks like. Now you can see two things about the data, which uh, this is like welcome to labor economics. Uh, first of all, it's kind of noisy and it's got a kind of unexplained trend. Okay, it's going down. And you could look at that data and you could say, well, actually, you know, after 1980, it looks like wages have fallen, uh, you know, at least maybe 15 or 20 percent relative to what they were doing before. So if you didn't have a control group, you might very well think, ah, you know, there looks like there could have been a pretty big effect of the Mariel boat lift on wages. But if you put the control group in, which I'm calling here uh, synthetic Miami in honor of Alberto Abadie, um, uh, you can see that actually it's also somewhat noisy, but the trend is very similar. And that, that under, illustrates basically the point of that, the, the simple paper that I wrote a long time ago, but also this really fundamental importance of a control group. 
If you don't have a control group, you're not allowed to assert causality, in my opinion. Uh, and this is a very good example of that. Now, later studies um, of the effects of migration, and, and in all honesty, there's many, many of those studies, and many of them are much better than my original study for a variety of different reasons. Um, several of them followed up on these ideas of mass migrations, like French nationals coming back to France after the end of the Algerian War, or Portuguese nationals coming back to Portugal after the end of the Angolan War. Uh, there's a couple of big migrations out of uh, Russia after the fall of the USSR, so a large number of uh, uh, Russian Jews moved to Israel. That's one of the largest migrations that people, uh, you know, percentage-wise on the, on the destination country. And there was a big migration of ethnic Germans uh, who had lived in Russia were allowed back to come to Germany after the collapse of the USSR. And most of those show some um, very small effects, although there is some uh, negative effects um, in the case of the German migration, which was the, the study there was actually written by a faculty member at Pia, uh, Pompeo Fabro, um, Albert Glitz. Is Albrecht here? Yeah. Okay. How am I doing, Albrecht? Is that a. Okay. <laughs> uh, and there's other research designs that have basically shown relatively small effects of migration. Uh, sometimes people find something. Um, now, just to, as an aside, uh, what about the, this violent separatist case? Um, so here's exactly the same kind of picture. And this is a study by Alberto Abadie, and I, I'm going to hesitate to pronounce the other uh, author's name. Large list of consonants starting with G. <laughs> uh, and in 2003, now this paper is pretty well known, but actually is an extremely important paper. Because in this paper, um, they, the, uh, it followed up on something that Alberto had been doing for a while. And he, they formalized the idea of how to construct a control group in these situations, the synthetic control group. And he was, they were interested in comparing uh, what happened in the Basque region after the emergence of the ETA separatist movement and the violence that they uh, brought. And so they basically dated that to around 1975, so after uh, the death of Franco. And they compared GNP per capita, which, you know, very standard uh, economic outcome, for the Basque region, which is the, the solid line, uh, with the, uh, what they called synthetic Basque region, which turns out to be 85% um, Catalonia and 15% Madrid, um, in case you're wondering <laughs> what the control group is. Um, and you know, there's another thing to learn. This is actually a, a picture of the graph from the American Economic Review paper in 2003. And what's remarkable about it is how crappy the graph was. <laughs> and so you, one thing that's going on in our field is we do better graphs these days. Okay. <laughs> but I, I think we have to put that up in honor of them. Okay. So another example, New Jersey minimum wage. Uh, early 1992, I was in Princeton. Alan Kruger and I were sitting next to each other. We had both done some earlier papers on the effects of these new state minimum wage laws. And New Jersey, where, which is where Princeton is, um, decided they were going to raise, possibly raise the minimum wage in um, April 1992. And so we decided we would try and construct a prospective study, more like the spirit of a real RCT in which we, we didn't you know, rely on data after the fact, like I had done in the Mariel Boatlift case, but rather we collected our own data and we went out and before the treatment happened, so kind of like when you do an RCT, you get people and you study them before anything happens and then you give one group the treatment and follow them after. So we, we conducted a survey of fast food restaurants in New Jersey and Pennsylvania just in February 1992, a couple of months before the minimum went up and then again in November 1992. Now, we probably should have um, thought about this more carefully at the time, but if you notice anything about that, February is not the same as November, okay? <laughs> so we had a pretty big seasonal problem in our data. I don't really remember why we thought we should do that, but that's what we did. Um, but we had a control group, okay? In fact, we had two control groups. We knew, because we lived in Princeton and we went down to the McDonald's and the Burger King just to check, that fast food restaurants in some parts of New Jersey were already paying wages that were above what the new minimum would be. So we knew that there would be, at least in some parts of New Jersey, we weren't sure how big, many there would be, there would be other restaurants that weren't affected by the minimum and then maybe some that were. So we thought we could possibly do an analysis where we had two control groups one across the border in a different state, and one within New Jersey where the firms weren't affected. 
Uh, and this is what we found. Uh, so this is New Jersey and Pennsylvania. This is, uh, people often talk about our paper and talk about New Jersey and Pennsylvania. If they saw this data, they might be a little less convinced. Uh, because you can see what happened in Pennsylvania is employment went down. Uh, this is the number of workers per store. It's around 23 in Pennsylvania to start and then falls. In New Jersey, it doesn't fall nearly as much. In fact, it's almost flat. So if you do the difference of differences, it looks like in uh, Pennsylvania, there was a decline, New Jersey flat. So instead of New Jersey falling, which you might have thought if the minimum wage went up, it was actually rising a little bit. Now, the reason why we were able to you know, hold our heads up and, and carry on was because when we uh, looked at the other comparison group, stores that were paying uh, already uh, above $5 an hour, uh, we got almost exactly the same uh, thing. So we had two control groups, which were both parallel. So, and that gave us some confidence and uh, basically fooled the referees into publishing our paper. Um, and you can see that either comparison gives almost the same answer in terms of it looks like the increase in the minimum wage, if anything, caused employment to go up in the affected stores relative to the seasonal trend that was going on in the others. Um, so these two designs gave the same answer. Now, there, in this area, there's also been many, many much better studies. Okay, so the, our study had many flaws, um, but these days uh, people are able to do studies that take uh, massive uh, data sets from, that come from uh, administrative records and combine uh, many, many cross-border designs all at once. And most of those uh, continue to find more or less the result that we, that we got. Um, okay, so what does this all mean uh, in terms of evidence-based policy? Well, let's think first of the case of immigration. So uh, my research and a lot of research that followed uh, in many, many countries and other settings typically finds that the effects of uh, immigration on native workers is quite small. Um, and there's a, a variety of different explanations for that. Nevertheless, uh, I think it's, and no one is going to, you know, object to my claim that uh, it's probably the case that migration policies have be, are going to become more restrictive in all countries around the world in the next few years. Um, and um, so the question is, is evidence not matter? Why, why is that people not paying attention? And I got interested in this question uh, in, in the early 2000s, and I was talking to a, a friend, Christian Dusman, and uh, Christian uh, and I and Ian Preston managed to convince the European Social Survey to put a bunch of questions on the survey uh, asking about how they felt about immigration policy, but also how they thought that uh, immigration affected the economy and what were the mechanisms by which those effects were important to them personally. And the way we were thinking about it was, we thought, well, you know, obviously some people think that uh, immigrants are going to come in and take jobs, and they might lose their job, or their child, or their uh, friends might lose their jobs. Other people might think, well, uh, immigration comes in, and people are going to crowd out the schools or um, pay less taxes, and so that's going to be a problem. That's are the kind of economic effects. But there's another group of people, uh, and I think this is um, probably the more, much more important group of people, uh, who think that the main thing that immigrants do is they come in and change the composition of the population. So the population goes from, you know, uh, in the United States context, uh, some European ethnicity, mostly white um, people to, that speak English, to some other group. Now, of course, in the United States, that's not quite true. Obviously, it's never been true that the population was, you know, 100% white or mostly spoke English. But that seems to be the, the, the main comparison. And there's a good example of that. In the US recently, there was a poll. 30% of respondents agreed that immigrants are invading our country and replacing our culture and ethnic background. And this is what's called replacement theory. And it's pretty common for um, more right-wing politicians to basically run on fear of replacement theory. You could say this is the basis of the Trump campaign. So what we did in our survey, and this was done some time ago, uh, well before the current round of um, uh, anti-immigrant um, uh, movements, but we asked uh, two sets of questions. We asked, do you agree that immigrants lower wages? Do you agree that immigrants uh, cause a budget problem for the government? And so on. So a series of questions on economic concerns. 
And then we asked another series of questions on what we called, and I've never come up with a good term for this, but we called compositional concerns. So do you agree it's better if everyone shares the same language or the same religion? Um, and then what we did, we had five of each of those kind of questions, and what we did was we constructed kind of an average of them. And so we had one dimension, which is sort of your concerns about the economic effects of immigration, and another about your concerns about the compositional concerns. And then we had a third set of questions, which was, do you think we should be uh, restricting the number of immigrants or not? Okay? And what we found was that people's views on immigration policy are most determined by their views about these compositional effects. So 80% of the differences between people in anti-immigrant or pro-immigrant policy changes are driven by concerns about compositional issues. And you can kind of see that very clearly in the data when you look at it because you see that, for instance, the typical person who's most anti-immigrant is a, a retired person living in a small town where there's no immigrants and actually if there are any immigrants, they run the hospital <laughs> where those people work. So it's kind of uh, like completely counterproductive from an economic point of view for the typical most anti-immigrant person. Uh, so, what this, I think, suggests is that uh, a lot of times when economists are thinking about something like an economic policy of, of immigration, they should be really thinking a little bit more broadly than just a simple supply and demand curve. They want to be thinking about um, uh, issues that might come up more in a political economy kind of context or other settings. And one thing that's happened in our field over the last 30 years is economists now are much more comfortable talking about a lot of those issues. Uh, so it isn't, it's no longer, economists no longer just talk about GNP per capita or employment rates or unemployment rates, they talk about lots of other stuff. And what this seems to suggest is that might be very important in helping to inform a policy debate, is fully understanding what are the sources of these compositional concerns. I think in the minimum wage case, you could make an argument that the evidence has been uh, more important. Um, Many states have raised, raised their minimum wages in the United States over the last uh, 30 years. Um, in the first 10 years after Alan and I uh, wrote our book, uh, which is 1994, we had a count on, our, um, on the board in Princeton which said how many states have actually raised their minimum wage, and it was zero for quite a long time. So we were originally thinking that we completely killed the minimum wage <laughs> with our work, but it, it, it has come back. In Europe, uh, I think there's been a lot more changes so the UK introduced its first minimum wage in 1998. Uh, contrary to a lot of predictions, it was generally perceived as having uh, positive distributional effects and very little employment. Similarly, Germany introduced its first in, in 2015. This one was particularly interesting because um, Angela Merkel's chief economic advisor was one of my old PhD students. Uh, and he was very strongly against raising the minimum wage, uh, despite his PhD from Princeton. Um, but he lost, and they did it anyway. And it turned out that it probably had, uh, you know, remarkably small employment effects, and maybe even some uh, surprising uh, reallocation effects that might be positive for the economy. Uh, so it's possible that some of those changes were driven by evidence. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think you know we'd be premature to claim credit for that. So to summarize, and this is my last slide. Um, we can use experiments and natural experiments and other research designs to try and answer causal questions uh, about how policies uh, uh, matter. And normally those kind of projects and research uh, uh, designs will involve previous policies. So to have uh, uh, scientific policy evidence, we've got to have uh, policies that changed beforehand so that we can kind of extrapolate. Methods like the difference of differences method are widely used um, by academic researchers they're also used a lot in, uh, in the tech sector and other business settings where people are trying to answer policy questions that are relevant for um, um, you know day-to-day -day business operation where an A-B testing kind of setup is not uh, feasible. Um, so that's good for uh, labor economists. We can get jobs in you know, high-paying companies. Um, and then uh, the, the last point I want to make is whether this evidence is really affecting how policies are made I think is, is uh, quite a bit less certain. Um, and you could make an argument that uh, in, despite the rise in policy, uh, you know, evidence-based policy, uh, it looks like you know, in a lot of countries the policy decisions are, are driven by much different forces than we've been able to analyze so far. So I'll stop there and I'll be glad to take some questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Professor Carr. Um, no sé si algú voldrà fer alguna pregunta. Ànims? Sí, un moment que ara us passarem el micròfon. Oh, we've got a microphone. Here we go. If you ask a question, I'll rephrase it to the question I want to answer. It's a trick I learned. All right, this is going to be an easy one. Um, so, um, what do you say about the common criticism of these experimental approaches of having very limited external validity uh, very often? I mean, how do you... Because, I mean, that's kind of something that comes up very often when, when people implement these methods. Right. So, Ambach has asked me about the... Um, uh, generalizability. I think the, the, what you can say about um, a lot of the policy analysis that I, the examples I was giving here, is it's, it's sort of like learning from experience in the same domain. So you say, previously when we raised a minimum wage in some slightly different setting, what effect did it have? Um, now what that doesn't tell you is what would happen if you raise the minimum wage to 50 euros an hour, obviously, and people will always raise that question. But that's not really you know, relevant for policy purposes anyway, right? Usually what's relevant is the kind of changes that have been implemented relatively recently. And a lot of times, I think uh, you know, the limitations of the um, previous evidence may not be so bad when you think, well, what people are really proposing to do is do exactly what New Jersey did in Pennsylvania, right? So whatever was wrong with the policy that they did in New Jersey will probably also be wrong with the policy in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, the, the coverage rates will be different or other issues. So I, th I think in some sense, if you're thinking about incremental policy changes, it's not so bad. If you're thinking about like wholesale reorganization of policy, uh, a reorganization of the economic system, I think that, that by for sure you can't generalize. What, what, on the other hand, what is needed for any kind of a modeling exercise, uh, which is, say, broader, where you're trying to devise a, a, a model of the economy, maybe a, a stylized model to allow you to inform debate, is you do need uh, estimates of various parameters which are going to be important in that model. And so you're going to need identification. Uh, which means that you're probably going to need some um, previous changes that the data can use to identify certain causal parameters in your, whatever your model is. So I think you, even if you're trying to build a, a more elaborate model, um, uh, quasi-experiments and, and other kind of big changes in the past are important uh, source of information. Earlier on in your talk, when you mentioned um, A-B testing for tech companies, you seem to suggest that sometimes A-B testing does not scale well um, when you apply it to the full population. And that means that randomized controlled trials do not always work. Um, I, would, I was wondering if you can elaborate under what conditions or what things we need to be careful, both from a um, business and policy um, um, right. application. Well, first let's start with medicine. Um, in medicine, it's very well known that this happens because a lot of times when you're doing the original RCT, the administration of the treatment is very heavily uh, monitored and controlled, and everybody in the treatment group gets the treatment, or almost everybody, and everybody in the control group does not get the, tr the treatment. And so you're, you're, you're kind of sure that um, you know, there's good compliance. Um, and, and when you actually try and get people to take drugs, it's amazing how many people, you know, don't have full compliance. They stop taking them or they fall off the wagon and they come back on and things like that. So it's usually hard to, in, in a medical case. In the, in the tech sector case, it's usually more like um, it's a scale problem. So it's when you just change uh, something in one part of the country that you're selling to, you can see an effect, but when you try and uh, scale that up, then you, you realize that there's some problem that you didn't fully anticipate. And that could have arisen in a small natural experiment too, because uh, you know, it, in, consistent with what Albrecht said, there are some sort of, you could think of them as slightly more like general equilibrium things that you're not gonna see in a small policy experiment that might be important if you, so if you're thinking about the federal minimum wage, you might 
not want to use a state minimum wage natural experiment, for example? Yes. OK, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Teresa. There seems to be a lot of evidence related to this Harris-Trump um, period with a lot of polls that says that Latinos are um, supporting Trump because of the uh, immigration policies, right, to be very much against immigration. But you mentioned that people are usually in large part against immigration because it's going to change their values, their culture, the language. That's not the case in this case, right? So is in this group, is it that the economics matters more because they could be displaced on their jobs or? It's possible. Usually um, when people study migration, a lot of times the uh, outcome that they're looking at is some labor market outcome for uh, native born people. And some studies do a separate analysis for previous migrants. It said, if you bring in more immigrants, does that have an effect on previous migrants? And I think it would be pretty common to find that if there is an effect, a, a negative effect, it's going to be on the previous migrants because they're the most likely to be doing exactly the same kind of jobs and in exactly the same labor markets and so on. To tell you the truth, though, I don't think that's the basis of the Hispanic uh, support for Trump. Um, I, th I think that's, it, that is much more about um, uh, some kind of cultural identity that's kind of hard to explain. You know, like why does a you know, Hispanic man want to have everybody be more Trumpian? I don't know. But I, I'd be very surprised. It's possible, but I'd be very surprised if the economics is really the main thing. Myself, yeah. Oh, hi. Um, sorry. The, sure. My question, I suppose, is a little bit about um, sort of how theory drives conflicting results in the literature and how we can sort of take away um, and make good faith public policy recommendations from that. So in particular, your work on, on the Mariel Boatlift follows in some, you know, a strain of the literature on that where... Um, and apologies if my understandings of the literature are incorrect, where there have been often different interpretations of sort of empirical evidence based on theoretical differences. So in particular, sort of um, Borjas's work on the Merrill Boatlift uh, and then later on with Perry. Um, so I suppose when we get different results based on different sort of theoretical structures uh, and different sort of models to set up and interpret our data from, how can we sort of go and make good faith public um, policy recommendations to, to, you know, and not experiment on people's lives? First of all, you know, there's always, you know, a lot of times, um, even in a quasi-experimental analysis, unless it's sort of a rigorously predefined analysis, there's a lot of choices that the analysts are making um, to, to sort of filter the data and so on to construct the statistics that they're ultimately going to show. And in that particular case you're talking about, it's nothing to do with anything about the theoretical debate. The argument is about like which particular workers are the ones whose wages you, you use to, to describe uh, wages before and after the Mariel boat lift. Um, and, you know, one set of people will tend to like the results or choose the specifications which uh, give one set of results and another set might choose the opposite. So people have to interpret the results in that light, I think. You have to say, well, I know that this particular author on average finds that immigration is uh, benign and so I, I think that they might be inclined to find a benign effect or their prior is strongly on that and so they might make some choices along those lines. And someone else might be inclined to find that immigration is terrible, and they would make a set of choices that would tend to give those results. And so I should interpret the results that way. Um, and that, that's unfortunately what you always have to do. One way that that's handled in the scientific literature is meta-analysis techniques. Um, and you know, for instance, in the minimum wage area, there's been a couple of meta-analyses where people put together all the studies and try and look at the, you know, how the, the, the central tendency of the results is and then try and understand why a certain set of results are sort of outliers. 
A lot of times in that literature, and I think in this particular, the Boatlift case, what you'd see is the, the, the results which are much different than kind of the conventional story or the, the, the modal story are from very small samples and have large standard errors or have very unusual features that stand out. So that's usually what we do. But you know, there's not gonna be any easy resolution of, of some of those issues because some people fundamentally believe uh, certain things. So uh, thank you, David, for the talk. So I have, I think, a related question, which is about um, what do you think is the role that uh, academic economists like you and like uh, me, um, what role you think we should or should try to play in terms of policy advice, which is the topic of your talk, because the way that I feel is that, you know, as someone uh, working on natural experiments, um, like you, I know how to do that. I know how to, okay, you know, think about something that happened in the past. I know how to, you know, look for data, think about the variation, and come up with some results that say, okay, this policy change had this effect. Uh, and then I can also read the literature. But then if the government is like reaching out and saying, okay, you know, how should we change the minimum wage for next year? Or how should we change, you know, family policy? Um, that is a question that I cannot answer directly with my, with my results from my analysis of, of previous reforms. And that's related to what you said earlier, but I think it's a bit broader because, you know, a, a policy change can have direct effects on the things that the government wants to target, but it may have effects on other dimensions that perhaps we haven't measured. Um, so it, I find it very hard to, you know, to give direct policy advice on, you know, future Right. changes on uh, in policies based on our types of analysis. So should we try it? Should we just say, this is what I found and you make the decision? Or um, how do you feel about that? Well, um, so first of all, I should say, I, I've never been directly involved in uh, policy advice. And actually, I, you know, if, if a reporter asks me uh, my opinion on a, a normative question, I refuse to give an answer. Um, so I, I don't take normative positions on anything. Um, which you know, some people find kind of strange, but I've, I've always found that works out. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my former, my old friend and former colleague, Alan Kruger, was sort of you know, involved heavily in, in government policy. But I think if you're an economist, at least in the United States, and if you're an economist in the, you know, in the White House or whatever, you're one of 50 voices or maybe 25 voices. Um, and you can tell, you're not the decision maker. You know? And economists aren't really the decision makers. Economists can only help provide evidence on a few aspects of the question. Maybe one thing we can do is say, look, we probably know this parts of this question, and we can, uh, you can help identify the other parts of the question that we don't know, we don't fully understand. Because that's actually a re remarkably hard uh, for other people to envision. Say, well, what, when you do this policy, what could go wrong, right? And in fact, in the United States, the main role of the Economic Council of Advisors is to basically shoot down bad ideas. Uh, every morning, <laughs> 10 bad ideas come out, and you know, 10 of them have to be disposed of by 5 p.m. that day. That, that's pretty much what you're doing. <laughs> and uh, you know, once in a, every you know, two months, somebody actually has something sensible that they're proposing, but their most ideas are really bad. And uh, you, know, you, you basically have to say, well, here's why, and here's maybe, maybe it's not even so much evidence-based as like, here's the, all the things that this person isn't thinking about with that policy. Yeah. Um, so you know, and, and actually, political campaigns bring up many, many of these <laughs> really bad ideas. Um, and so you know, that, that's something we can do, I think. Yeah. My question is about these synthetical scenarios you were talking about before, like for example, the Basque Country or uh, I, I thought that it is Miami. How do you choose the composition of them? How do you know that, for example, 85% of Barcelona and 55, 55%, 15% uh, of Madrid add up to, for example, the Basque Country? Thank you. Ah. The reality is there's not really a um, 100% right answer. So the, the, the way to think about it is, uh, a comparison group 
in, in, a, in many different, so differences kind of studies, like uh, you, you have a, a priori selected a, a comparison group like New Jersey and Pennsylvania or low wage and high wage stores or whatever. Uh, in, a, in, the, in this more synthetic control group story, um, you're kind of con trying to construct a group, a comparison group that in the past has had parallel trends with the, um, the treatment group of interest. And that is, you know, so you're building on this idea that a, a good comparison group will have trended the same as the treatment group prior to treatment. And if there's a lot of periods beforehand that you can judge that over, and um, then, then it, it's, it's more plausible, but it's never 100% certain. Um, and so, it, you know, uh, it, there's a hierarchy of, um, of um, non-experimental evidence that's used by some of the meta-analysis teams in the um, uh, Department of Education in the US and other places, and they, they sort of put RCTs at the top and then um, very uh, well-identified regression discontinuities second, and then difference of differences kind of third. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it's, it's not quite in the same category as a real RCT because you haven't randomly assigned the groups, and so you're never really sure. But the idea is to try and use as much evidence as possible on the pre-period. So it's more compelling if there's longer pre-period and more, more uh, data to do that. And Alberto's been working on, Abadi has been working on this for a long time and has quite a few uh, pretty good papers on this. Um, and so he was the one who kind of came up with the idea of taking not just an, I did the average of four cities, just took the average, but he had the idea of using partial averages, like you know, 0.85 and 0.15 or whatever. Uh, so in a way, I think that, that's a major advance and it's widely used in the tech sector, I can tell you that. But, it's, it's not entirely uh, without f potential problems, yeah. Ultima pregunta, yeah. Thank you. Uh, just to be the devil's advocate, I'm going to disagree, but that doesn't mean that I agree or I don't agree. Um, so you have said that 80%, according to your, to your study, 80% of the differences in the before study talking about the thoughts on immigration was caused by compositional matters. And well, there have been different studies, for example, in the Ministry of Finance in Denmark, 2017, that said that the netto contribution of immigrants coming from different countries differed. Meaning that maybe not controlling for the country of origin could cause a, a difference in how we interpret if that um, tendency is it's positive or negative or cause any effect at all. So I'm asking, could we have underestimated the economic effect of immigration? Could not controlling for the for country affect the result of economic effects of immigration? And could the differences in compositional matters uh, could actually cause economic differences? Uh, um. So let me a answer or respond to that in uh, two ways. One, um, certainly um, people that work in the migration area, and I do a little bit of work in this area, I think it's, it's extremely important to acknowledge that um, in most countries, migrants are extremely diverse population. So in, uh, if I was giving a talk on immigration to a general audience, I usually start with a, a, a picture of the distribution of education of immigrants in the United States. And so immigrants are way more likely to have a PhD than natives and are way more likely to have no education credentials at all than natives. So there, I, I usually describe it as, it's like going into a hospital and you realize that both the doctors and the janitors are migrants. And that's 100% true if you go to an American hospital. Everybody's a migrant, but they're all very all different skill distributions. And you could make an argument, I think, that um, the economic costs of um, and 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 potentially maybe the compositional concerns about different uh, groups of migrants, either classified by their skills, which is more the way an economist would do it, or potentially, I guess, somebody would say, well. I would like to have more white migrants, and someone else would say, I don't mind having non-white migrants, 
And so you could imagine that, uh, people would say that. Um, implicitly, I think that that's sort of true in a lot of, of, of situations. Um, another question that I sometimes ask people when they're talking about migration is, how do you feel about ha having more babies in your country? So most people are like, oh yeah, we need more babies. And then, and then you say, well, how do you feel about more immigrants? And they say, we hate immigrants, okay? Now, the problem is, most economic models, unless you start really getting into this heterogeneity thing, those two things are the same, because they're just increases in population. And, and, and actually, quite a few simple-minded economic models, even the standard macro models, you know, they're, they're all the same, because skill groups are perfect substitutes with each other. And so in, in that case, those two things are the same. So if you like immigrants, or don't like immigrants, but you like babies, that has to be a compositional issue, in my view. Um, but uh, if you're, you could potentially, I think, recognize quite a few differences within the immigrant populations in different settings, for sure. Okay, perfect. Um, Professor Ka, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. It has been really interesting. Um, moltes gràcies a tots per la vostra assistència i el vostre interès. Crec que ara ja sí que ho puc dir, que queda oficialment inaugurat el curs acadèmic 2024-2025. Moltes gràcies a tots. Gràcies.